Well, thank you, Yang, and welcome Professor Mariana Matsukato, one of the world's most influential economists on the need to rethink capitalism and government to advance public health. So wonderful to be with you. Thank and you, Molly. We've, uh, yeah, we've got uh, what, a bunch of questions that we want to get your input on. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I, have a, I enjoyed your book, so thank you for that. Thank you for buying it or for getting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's just such a different way of thinking. So um, our first question is, we've seen the global economy take a beating over the past uh, 15, 16 months, obviously with an outsized impact on women and racialized communities. And for you, what is the connection between public health and the health economy? Well, it's a really good question. And it's, to be honest, not a question that has not been asked. I just think the framing has been problematic. So at best, what we've heard in the past is that it's important to invest in health. And that's also good for the economy. Whereas, you know, the kind of work that I've been trying to advocate and also am now doing as the chair of the World Health Organization's Council on the Economics of Health for All is that we really need to first ask, what is the ambition? What is the actual goal that we're trying to achieve? So, you know, COVID-19 has woken us up to that if we don't have health for everybody, we are all worse off. And health for all is in fact what the mission should be with the vaccine itself. It's not enough to have a vaccine if everyone doesn't have access to it. And so if we begin with ambitions like health for all, what does it mean in terms of backtracking then on how we have to set up our economy? What does it mean for how we might do outcomes oriented budgeting? What does it mean for how we might actually structure procurement processes and procurement budgets, which every government has to kind of funnel in innovative solutions towards public goals, just like we did for the moon landing where NASA was very clear what the goal was getting to the moon and back, but kept very open the how and also redesigned its procurement precisely in order to kind of, you know, be focused on the outcome, but again, very, very uh, open um, on all the kind of different types of innovations that might happen along the way. And so I think the connection between health and the economy has to be both a kind of old way of thinking, which is, of course, we need, you know, stronger health systems if we're going to have a stronger economy, but also how do we structure our economy to actually deliver on the goals that we want? And it has to get into the kind of nitty gritty of, again, the design of the tools, grants, loans, procurement, and budgeting. And if we don't do that, unfortunately, it just all remind remains kind of at the talk level. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, and, you know, I know that when we have seen women and racialized communities affected more, and we see just that unevenness, even just globally. So yeah, we definitely have to think about doing things differently. Um, thinking about COVID some more, COVID has focused government attention on driving tangible health care and public health outcomes. And what are some of the examples of jurisdictions that have effectively leveraged and pivoted their public health resources in ways that will last beyond the pandemic? Well, you know, hopefully we have uh, examples of that. I, I I think what we have currently are different patchy things that are happening that we can learn from. And the challenge really is to kind of scale up those lessons. So I actually um, co-authored a report with Akim Steiner, the head of UNDP, looking precisely at those parts of the world like Kerala, a region in India, um, Vietnam. You know, these are two developing regions which actually did quite well uh, during the pandemic, especially given the context that they're facing on their own developmental trajectory, but they did well because they had made investments within their own state institutions and also in terms of actually fostering dynamic partnerships between the public sector, the private sector, civil society organizations on the back of, you know, previous crises they had both health and other like the Nipah virus outbreak. Um, and so unfortunately, this is not what we've seen in many parts of the world where there's been a lot of outsourcing of government capacity to consulting companies in, in the UK where I'm sitting right now. We have overly consultified our government to the point that uh, Lord Agnew, um, who's a Tory Lord in the UK government, recently said that he thought that this over-reliance on, say, Deloitte to do the test and trace 
but also PwC, McKinsey to do both the kind of, you know, uh, consulting around Brexit and again around COVID was infantilizing. That was his word, infantilizing Whitehall. So the government. And there's no problem in using consultants or, of course, working with the private sector. In fact, we need public-private partnerships, but you don't outsource your brain, your capacity to govern, your capacity to manage to the private sector, just like the private sector shouldn't do that. Otherwise, it will lose its own capacity. So any sort of organization that's responsible for creating value and is an active you know, value creator in the economy needs to be thinking of its own dynamic capabilities and capacity. And unfortunately, what COVID has shown us is that we don't have that capacity. We did so badly globally in terms of delivering personal protection equipment to frontline workers, to you know, developing proper test and trace systems, at least in the first lockdown, um, very poorly in terms of combating the digital divide. So, so many students globally, and this is both in the developed and the developing world who were locked in their homes, just did not end up getting access to their human right to education because of the digital divide. And again, the vaccine, it's not enough to have it if we don't know how to govern vaccine production for the public good and not just private profit. And so, you know, these are all real wake up calls on the need to invest in the ability to govern all those different processes. And, you know, that includes, by the way, in the private sector, what we've seen over the last kind of half century in many private companies is this obsession about just uh, maximizing shareholder value. And you know, that means that you have companies like Pfizer, for example, or Exxon and Energy, you know, investing a huge amount or spending a huge amount of their profits just on buying back their shares to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. And so this lack of reinvestment of profits into the economy is a huge problem. And so you know, that stakeholder value notion, purpose-driven corporate governance, and mission-oriented public sector uh, policy that we just talked about, but also the investment within the public sector to deliver on goal-oriented policies by rethinking how to do procurement in dynamic ways and so on. All these, I think, are really important lessons. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, we've seen some of that, some of those issues that you raised in the UK, we, we have also seen in, in Ontario and Canada as well, for sure. And just yeah, so many things that we've realized we're missing, including, you know, basic things like manufacturing and biomanufacturing. Yeah. So um, I'll move on to the next question. How do we balance innovation versus accessibility when it comes to healthcare? It can be challenging to find a balance, especially in domains like therapeutics, where the cost of bringing a new treatment to market averages $1 billion. So how can we continue to provide incentives for innovation, including financial incentives, while ensuring that treatments are priced in a way that keeps them broadly accessible? Nice, easy questions. <laughs> so, I mean, I've been writing about this for quite some time. So in a book I wrote called The Entrepreneurial State, I looked at different sectors, including health, and how we've often had the wrong narrative of where that innovation actually comes from. So of course, you know, private sector investment is very important. Um, but the way that we frame the role of the public sector has often been at best to just fix market failures, dismissing actually the you know, massive amount of risk taking and actual investment that governments have had to make and have made in areas like the internet economy, nanotech, biotech, pharmaceuticals, today in the clean tech sector. So you know, especially in health, what's extraordinary is just the amount of public investment, which has often come in in the early high risk high capital intensive phase of drug innovation. And so in the United States, which pretends to be a market you know, model of, of you know, uh, capitalism has actually always had a very visible hand of the public sector and health innovation. So the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, invest over 40 billion a year recently in health innovation and actually have since the um, 1940s. And so the first problem is that if we don't have a narrative, a discourse, literally a storytelling, about that public investment, then the actual prices that we have in, you know, in health don't reflect what is a collective value creation process by both public and private investment. If we pretend that it's all private investment and the public sector is just there to kind of fix market um, failures, invest a bit in basic research, but then get out of the way and at best do a bit of regulation, we don't really capture that, that collective risk taking. Um, and if we did, then the kind of pricing models we'd have would be very different from the value-based pricing models. That's the technical word, value-based pricing, which basically just allows prices to go to what the market will bear. 
Um, and then of course you have welfare states that might come in and subsidize some of that cost, but we need to get the prices right in the first place. So the taxpayers basically not you know, paying two or three different times, first for, for the innovation and then for these very high uh, prices and then for the welfare state to subsidize those prices. And, and what's extraordinary in the US is the government has by right legally the ability to apply margin rights to the prices of drugs that they've contributed to, but they've never actually implemented those margin rights, which shows, I think, that there's also a confidence problem. If you don't talk about yourself as a co-investor, you then don't have the confidence to say, oh, but wait, we must make sure that the prices actually reflect that. Second, the intellectual property rights, so patents in this area, have, I think, really been abused. They, you know, there's something wrong with having patents. I'm not against patents, but we need to make sure they're structured, again, towards common good objectives, because patents are a contract between the state and business for 20 year monopoly profits, basically. And what the state gets back is once that patent is over after 20 year, uh, years or so, there's more diffusion of the knowledge uh, that goes across the economy, unlike say in the middle ages where we just had a lot of secrecy. But you know that's only if they're structured in such a way to enable those kind of knowledge spillovers at the end of the patent. If in the meantime, we're patenting too much upstream, so the tools for research are being patented, and if the patents are too wide, so actually blocking any sort of learning around an area, and so patents just used for strategic reasons, and if they're too strong, hard to license, this leads to what William Baumol, a very well-known economist who passed away some years ago, called unproductive entrepreneurship, or in my book called The Value of Everything, I called value extraction. So we need to really be attentive to structuring the innovation process itself, through intellectual property rights in a particular way, uh, not allowing them to be abused. We need to make sure that the prices of drugs, again, reflect that collective contribution. And of course, we also need solidarity you know, globally uh, right now in a moment, say, of a health pandemic. And, and, but we can't just rely on, say, charity, whether that's philanthropies during the, you know, in, in different health areas or right now you know, with the G7 agreement to donate 1 billion doses when we actually need 11 billion, we also really need to change the the production structure. We need to govern innovation differently. In other words, we need to change how the business model itself is structured as opposed to just relying on handouts. Yeah, and I really like what you said about government investing in innovation. Um, in Canada, we do see our government investing in research, but that's more at the invention stage and the innovation mm. stage is really investing in, in companies more to to take advantage of those inventions. Um, so there's there's programs in the US, even small programs like the SBIR that we don't yeah. quite have in Canada that I think are hugely effective in terms of mobilizing those highly innovative companies at the very early stages. Um, and so and and so and, and I didn't actually know about that that law about the margin right. So that's that's fascinating and one of my colleagues here, Al Edwards, thinks actually that we spend, our companies spend so too much on, on patents and they shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. that till much, much later Absolutely. in the process because everybody's, typically you've got that herd mentality and everybody's, you know, patenting around one idea and every little thing yeah. around it. And that blocks collective intelligence. Yeah, it's, it is a. Um, it's a different model and a different way of thinking about let's just have open science and yeah, we understand the importance of have, you know, protecting your IP, but maybe further down the road. Exactly. Um, okay. So when we look at the global scale, we see that, and you talked about this already, that disparity playing out when it comes to vaccine administration and distribution and that gulf is emerging between, it's ama amazing actually how rapid everything has happened within this pandemic, right? And yeah. this gulf is emerging between wealthy and developing countries. Um, so you just mentioned donating 1 billion, we need 11 billion. How can we ensure vaccines are equitably available around the world? I mean, you know, there's only so far that again, charity can go. I think we need to really question whether vaccines should be produced in a for-profit kind of a model. I think that's one big question. Um, you know, we know that with the health pandemic, again, unless vaccines are available to everyone, it's, it's, it's not gonna work. We're all gonna remain unsafe. 
And so, you know, there are certain items that for sure in, in even modern day capitalism, we can talk about as having to be produced with a very different type of governance structure. And I think vaccine, vaccines are one of them. Um, I think, you know, what we've seen with the vaccine is you have both the vaccine apartheid, which is what Dr. Tedros is calling it, when you have, you know, 80% of the doses being hoarded by five or 10% of the countries, but also coming back to this issue of intellectual property rights, you know, this idea of having either a patent waiver or a patent pool um, is very important because that, again, goes to the business model, the innovation model itself. So the idea is we have to rely less just on kind of, you know, voluntary charitable givings in this space and much more in actually mandatory different ways to produce in the first place and hence my kind of emphasis on intellectual property rights. We can also of course use more things like prize schemes which have actually been very important in different types of innovations in different sectors where you know governments and philanthropies can be using you know prizes for um, you know companies that actually come up with certain types of inventions so we don't have to rely on patents and the price system to be the kind of only types of incentives we're providing to the private sector. And especially again, in an area that has such a strong public good um, dimension. But I mentioned in passing before this concept of collective intelligence. And I think if you look at the different discussions that are being had across the world, for example, the idea of a people's vaccine that was especially put forth by the Costa Rican government. And again, talked about by people, including Dr. Tedros at WHO, you know, really the idea there is also to ask, how do we best, you know, share knowledge? How can we construct real kind of collective intelligence in terms of the tools, the therapies, and not only the vaccine in a, in a COVID pandemic? And what does it mean then to structure public-private partnerships in such a way that does foster that collective intelligence instead of just kind of, you know, private rent-seeking? Um, and your point before about procurement and SBIR in the U.S., I mean, I think what's so interesting about the U.S. model is that it's mainly been applied just to wartime scenarios. Or again, in my book, I talk about the space race, where because the government really saw it as an urgent priority, uh, they then you know, put the full weight of government behind a project, the Apollo program. And we're very clear that that required a change in the procurement practices. In fact, they moved it away from a cost plus model towards a fixed price model with incentives for innovation and quality improvement, which kept both costs low, but increased the innovation outcome. Um, and I think, and, and, and by the way, they also had a no excess profits clause, which was so interesting precisely because NASA saw itself as you know, a key contributor to the process. They thought, well, we, we need to be sharing the rewards and they put a no excess profits clause, which we don't have by the way today in space <laughs> uh, where you know, the space race is becoming again, almost a playground for billionaires to do their pet projects on the back of a huge public infrastructure. So you know, coming back to the, the the issue around health. I mean, how do we actually structure the tools on the ground to foster the kind of you know, outcomes that we want while keeping very open the innovation space and redesigning things like procurement and so on to deliver that. And by the way, when the US Department of Defense invests in health, because they do, because soldiers die you know, in the war field and it's not just the Department of Health that makes those investments, they have been much more careful to make sure that the deal, the contract between the state, say through DARPA, um, and, and the, say the pharmaceutical companies is, is the correct deal, is a symbiotic and mutualistic deal. So they make sure that the soldiers on the ground actually have access to the medicines that they helped fund. Somehow we've forgotten to do this with the departments of health. We just put in all this money you know, into the health innovation system and then don't make sure to structure the deal in such a way that the citizens co-investing in that process get access. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you're investing in early stage research, it's harder to draw a straight line between yeah. an invention and here's a product, right? And and so I think that could be a whole discussion yeah. on it. Well, there's lots of uncertainty, you know, risk and uncertainty are different. Risk, you can actually model like a, prob a probability distribution around it. Uncertainty is when you just really don't know. And innovation is very much characterized by uncertainty. So that kind of sharing of that uncertain space, but admitting that all the different actors have to do that, as opposed to assuming that one will just de-risk the other, I think is itself part of the narrative change. Yeah. Um, we have barely time for one more question, but I'm going to try and squeeze it in um, because it's such an important question. Uh, increasingly, um, 
the value in society has been uh, equated with financial value. Um, and so how do initiatives like value-based care help create new frameworks that will truly help people? Well, you know, again, a very interesting question and, and it's, it's related to your first question um, when you were talking about women and also lots of different vulnerable groups, um, you know, really in some ways uh, being hurt the most um, from this pandemic. And that includes many healthcare workers who are women and who are often not valued. So when we have a, a system whereby we confuse price with value, which was the thesis of my book called The Value of Everything, then we get this tautology where we assume that just because a part of the population that, for example, is getting paid a lot, like Goldman Sachs workers, they must be more valuable. And, and you know, this is why uh, Lloyd Blankfein, after the financial crisis, he was the CEO of Goldman Sachs, had the, the guts to say that, that Goldman Sachs workers were the most uh, productive in the world. And you might laugh at it, but he, he was right. If we look at productivity in terms of output per labor, when we don't know how to value the output of, say, public health workers, because the actual output might end up being free to the consumer, then we are only valuing the input, right? So, it, so that's why we, again, coming back to the narrative and the storytelling, we talk about public investments in health, not as investment, but expenditure and costs, right? And that in fact feeds the kind of austerity, which by the way, I really fear we're gonna have again because there's lots of money being put into the system through COVID-19 uh, recovery funds. And already there's all this talk about, ooh, the deficit, oh, the debt, we're gonna have to then you know, claw back. And that's, that clawing back, which sometimes is called austerity, is exactly what made this health pandemic much worse than it actually had to be. So knowing how to value the work of women, of carers, of public health workers, of public school teachers in such a way that is both, if you want valuing them, so the price of their labor is properly compensated, but beyond the, the kind of income side of the, the discussion, which would bring us to another conversation, the actual output of what has been produced in the system, if we don't know how to value that, for example, in GDP, because there's no price to it, we have a huge problem. So GDP, in fact, doesn't include the, the proper value of a well-structured, dynamic, creative public education or public health system when it's free at point of, of, at point of use, which is absolutely mad if you think about it. You know, in the modern 21st century, we just look at the inputs, the cost of the teachers, the cost of the nurses. So I think, you know, similarly, you know, making sure that we're not confusing that, that the prices of drugs are also, um, you know, including the value of all the different types of collective value creators that I talked about before, public, private, you know, third sector is increasingly important. That also is very, you know, key, but that means we need a, a theory and a narrative of value as collectively created. Instead, in economic theory, we still assume that value is just created in business and then it's facilitated or at best enabled or the market is fixed by the public sector. And that's why so many of these initiatives that you and I are talking about need to be accompanied by a new theory, a new framing, a new narrative. It's not just about better policy. Yeah, well, you know, I know you've, um, you've written so many books and um, opined on so many important uh, aspects of our society. And uh, I'm sorry that we don't have, you know, 200 minutes and we only have 20, but I wanna thank you so much, Professor Mariana Matsukato. That was um, just thrilling for me to have the opportunity to um, be with you even online remotely and, and learn a, just a little bit from you. I wanna tell the audience to uh, stay tuned, please. We have the investor roundtable coming up in just a few minutes and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.